So good morning, everybody. It's, it's good to see you like show up in such large numbers at this earlier time, given, I guess, the bar and uh, things yesterday. My name is Vijay Karamsheri. I am the Chief Technology Officer for Veridant uh, Systems. And I'm going to tell you about our Green Cloud server family today. Uh, so I must start off with an apology. My marketing team didn't really tell me that, you know, sponsor keynotes were meant to be infomercials. So this might actually end up being more technical than most of you expect. Okay. So those of you who actually had an opportunity to walk by our booth yesterday would have, you know, seen tall claims of 50x performance, 70x performance improvements over, you know, commodity MySQL servers. And if I were in your shoes, I'd look at this with extreme skepticism. You know, to borrow a technical phrase uh, from our co-sponsor Kickfire's presentation yesterday, this almost seems magical. Okay. So my goal for the next 20 minutes is to demystify this for you and make you see how, what is the technical underpinnings for where we are getting these performance. Okay. So let me start off with a brief background about Veridant. Uh, we are a startup with offices in Milpitas in Bangalore, India. Uh, we've been up for the last three years. And uh, the vision of the company is to essentially build uh, and rethink what is the appropriate building block for data-centric scale-out infrastructures. And the way we are accomplishing this is by co-optimizing the hardware and the software that goes into these servers while still operating within the footprint of an industry standard x86 server platform. What we have announced at the beginning of this week is a tuned set of server boxes, you know, one for MySQL and for MCACHT. And just in case you happen to miss our large booth in the exhibition hall, we are a diamond sponsor for the event too. Okay? So now that, you know, we're past that formality, let me tell you what this talk is about. Okay? I think we find ourselves in an incredible time, you know, seeing phenomenal growth in MySQL deployments. And I believe the recession has helped a little bit in this regard. If anything, the, de the deployments are going to grow further. And the question that I kind of want to like focus this talk around is can we do better from the point of view of what is the server building block that we should be using for building such scale out infrastructures? Uh, there are a couple of terms in the title, you know, smart scaling and storage class memory. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll get a sense of, you know, in what sense am I using them? Uh, smart scaling is essentially asking the question, what is the right building block? And storage class memory, you should wait and see, you know, and hopefully you'll know what it is and why you should care. So let me start off by, I guess, depicting if, what should be a very familiar evolution for MySQL deployments. And, you know, and, and all of you are in some stage of this or the other. So it starts off from a single server. You kind of go replicate this either at the master-master level or, or using some slaves. You add a few caching tiers in front of it. And at some point or the other, you kind of get into the sharded infrastructure with whatever is surrounding, you know, the whole control infrastructure that is necessary around it. So if one kind of takes a look at, you know, this process of scaling MySQL deployments, there's a number of lessons that come out, or at least the way we look at it. There is the good. And the good is that there's been best practices convergence. So the community as a whole, and, 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 and I guess the larger industry, has converged on the use of x86 commodity boxes, you know, mechanisms like sharding or read caching, as a way of building really scalable, highly available, highly performance infrastructures. This strategy works. Some of the world's largest websites deploy the strategy, and clearly if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for the rest of us as well. However, this scheme does come with a bad. And the bad is operational complexity involved in doing the scaling. As I'm sure a lot of you will agree with, the idea of replication and sharding, while effective, does not come for free. Now, so if I take sharding as an example, the fact that you're being forced to make choices on breaking up what used to be a query against a single database into a step of multi-step queries, deal with issues of database integrity or load balance, is complexity. And, and it's interesting, and I think these are quotes from members in this community, which is, you know, you see a wide spectrum of thoughts about sharding. You know, there are those who say, you should start off with a sharded architecture, and then there's an equal number of you who says, try and avoid it, you know, thing. And I think Mark Callahan in his talk yesterday said, sharding is easy, it's resharding that's difficult, which is kind of, I think, gets to the point there, right? But in addition to just the point of managing the scale-out architecture, the other issue that I see is, you know, once you reach, go beyond a certain number of servers, you buy in into another level of complexity. You know, if you manage a large number of smaller servers, you start coping with issues like, you know, what is the average load, what is the peak load, how do you provision for it, et cetera. So there are some questions here. 
Can complexity be reduced if each individual server was more capable? And are today's commodity x86 servers really the best design point for scale out infrastructures? And to try and get a handle on this, let's take a closer look at what limits the performance of a MySQL or in general a database server. And I claim that more often than not, these servers tend to be IO limited, right? And if you're taking, say, InnoDB as a specific example of a storage engine under MySQL, there have been a number of recent improvements from this community, Google, Percona, the InnoDB plugin to mention a few, and of course, you know, Heike and his team at InnoBase, that have addressed the multi-core scaling issues that have, that have been associated with the storage engine. I guess all of you will also agree that additional tuning needs to be done on the IO path, particularly to deal with the high IOPS that SSDs or you know, the other kinds of storage infrastructures will provide. But there are fundamental bottlenecks that remain. And our way to think about these bottlenecks is something that I refer to as the performance persistence gap between DRAM and disk. So if you take a look at a commodity server architecture or a standard server architecture today, you find that the components essentially classify themselves into two silos. There is the performance but not persistent silo, which consists of the CPUs, you know, really high-end ones, fine, tightly integrated memory, and then there is the persistence, but you, know, you give up a little bit on performance silo, which is where the disks, et cetera, tend to be. So on the left silo, the performance silo, you can do random byte-level access, uh, and however, you give up a little bit on capacity, you don't get persistence. On the right, you get large capacity, persistence, block act, but however, the cost that you pay is for you to retrieve any information from that portion, you need to incur expensive you know, block calls and software overheads, et cetera. Now there's a lot of buzz about SSDs, NAND-based uh, devices. And in a sense, they improve the performance characteristics of the persistent silo, but they don't really fundamentally change the interaction from the application level. Now, a lot of the applications have adapted themselves to this dichotomy by saying that, hey, the things that we want to like, do with high performance we're gonna try and move the data from the persistent silo into the performance silo before we operate on it. We're gonna try and buffer it as much as possible there before we write it back for persistence reasons. So they have adapted themselves, however this adaptation comes with overhead. Okay? And, and that, in my opinion, is what will fundamentally limit the performance of these kinds of applications. So what can we do about it? Is there a way to bridge the performance persistence gap? And what is interesting is that we are in a period of time where technology advances actually allow us to build hardware and put it into the context of a server platform with the hardware having the blended characteristics of DRAM and disk. So this is a construct that we refer to as storage class memory. It is closely coupled with the CPU complex, resides in the performance bucket. And it is this, it's, it's somewhat you know, unique in terms of the characteristics that it brings into play. So one way to kind of describe the characteristics and the attributes of storage class memory is by looking at you know, traditional attributes like what is the capacity of the storage, you know, what is the read and write performance that you can bring to bear, is it persistent or not, and just to kind of put it into context, what is the match for these characteristics to database access patterns. So DRAM typically tends to be tens of gigabytes in capacity. You know, on the persistent side, you'll see up to a terabyte or higher, uh, hundreds of nanoseconds on one side, hundreds of microseconds on the other side, at the very least, uh, pers no persistence, persistence on the other. So if you kind of take a look at this, storage class memory actually brings you disk-like capacity, disk-like persistence, and DRAM-like performance. And what this allows you to do at the application level, and specifically for a database application, is to blend the kinds of things that you used to do, either using only DRAM or using only disk. And by blending these two, what you get is a bunch of efficiencies that were previously unavailable to you. Now this seems magical, to repeat a phrase that I said before, is this even possible to implement something like this? And the answer is, yes, it very definitely is, and not just using a single technology, but a blend of technologies. So the three technologies that dominate are NOR flash, which is a type of code flash that is used in cell phones, a hardware combination of DRAM and NAND flash, and emerging phase change memory technologies, all of these memory technologies at the, at the raw level possess the characteristics that interest us. They allow you to build systems with hundreds of gigabytes to half a terabyte worth of capacity that can be accessed at DRAM class hardware performance levels, 250 to 500 nanoseconds to load a cache line. Uh, writes are fairly reasonable, you know, hundreds of megabytes all the way up to a gigabyte per second type of bandwidth. And most importantly, it's persistent 
and it allows you to blend the kinds of application uses that you'll put them to. <clears throat> However, having SEM-like memory components is just one part of the overall solution. What Viridin's green cloud architecture does is to try and take this raw hardware level capability and put it all the way up to the application level. And in order for us to do this, we need to carefully orchestrate both the hardware and the software interfaces at the server level. So if one takes a look, you know, one obvious choice that jumps out is, hey, this looks like a disk, can I just put a block storage interface on it? And the claim is, if you do that, and you look at, say, a traditional block layer stack, the amount of latencies and overheads that get introduced by the time the application gets access to this data is way too much for these performance benefits to show through. More recent stacks that have been developed in the context of performance SSDs that optimize both the hardware interface, you're thinking of putting them on a PCI Express interface or something similar, or building an optimized block driver interface, help, but not completely. And what they suffer from here is the fact that there's a translation that needs to happen between the block granularity at which the application wants to access the data and the granularity at which the lower levels of the stack deliver the information. So for instance, the application might be interested in a few hundreds of bytes at, the, at a single row level. However, there's multiple kilobytes that end up getting transferred from the lower levels. What one needs instead is a more tuned stack. You know, something that blends the characteristics of a block device as well as that of a memory device, and that's essentially what the green cloud architecture brings to the table here. So you have a very optimized memory class interface in order to like access the memory resources of storage class memory directly, and however you also, pretend, also provide a file system-like interface so applications can interface with it using standard ones. So these cut-through stacks are the ones that deliver the performance levels that you like seek and desire. So the Viridin Green Cloud Server for MySQL, which was announced earlier this week, is the first incarnation of this Green Cloud architecture. As I had mentioned earlier, it's a co-optimized hardware and software solution. Our first generation products use NOR Flash as the underlying technology for building the storage class memory solution. The product features, depending on the, on, on the level that you're looking at, contains from one to four quad-core x86 CPUs, 16 to 64 gigabytes of DRAM, and up to half a terabyte of storage class memory. Uh, it is it's, uh, distinguished by the fact that you have direct hardware access to SCM resources. We have optimized the InnoDB storage engine, so it's made aware of the, the fact that it can, in fact, interact with a database that is stored in SCM. And the result is that you get in-memory database performance. So to, just to quantify that, let me kind of go through a, a benchmark that uh, uh, we, we have developed in consultation with independent consultants in the community. This model's a Web 2.0 workload, you know, something that most of you would be familiar with, very select heavy, tend to be simple selects. Uh, there might be a few multi-table joins, for instance, if you want to like, figure out user relationships. Reads tend to dominate writes. And what this graph shows, and I've broken down, and, and I, when I talk about this, I'll break down the queries into different buckets, simple queries, complex joins, and a 90-10 mix. Um, and plot the relative performance. And notice that the relative performance scale is a log scale for reasons that will become clear. Comparison with a standard industry server, which is, say, a RAID of SAS 15K RPM disks, this solution provides two or, close to two orders of magnitude performance improvement on this workload. So on the blended 9010 workload, we can offer 70x the performance benefit of an industry standard server. Now, you should be skeptical. You know, where is 70x going to come from? You know, these things don't happen overnight. There are two reasons for it. The first reason is by storing the database contents in storage class memory resources, which is, which is five orders of magnitude faster to access uh, compared to the corresponding, you know, storing it in disk, that's one big contributor to the benefit. The other big contributor to the benefit is the fact that unlike a block storage stack, which forces you to like load more data than the application really requires and then throw away most of it, this allows you to actually load the specific data of interest. Both of these contribute in roughly equal parts. We see about a 5x benefit just because of the word level focused access that results from this. Now I'm sure several of you in the audience are also wondering, hey, this is wonderful, but is SAS RAID really the right thing to compare with? How do we compare with high performance SSDs? Performance benefits still exist. They're fairly significant. Uh, and you know, clearly much more cost effective. So compared to the highest performance PCI Express SSD that's available out there, we deliver about a 5x improvement in performance on this workload. 
A little more detail about the InnoDB optimizations that we have done. Primarily, they have to do with the buffer pool management layer. Uh, and basically, what we have done is we have augmented this uh, by you know, bringing in the knowledge of storage class memory resources there. So we avoid the data transfers that are involved in there and kind of manage the different layers of storage. So in addition to doing that, we have done a bunch of optimizations with uh, you know, the read-write path and other I.O. optimizations. Uh, and this is the first step, really, because I, I believe the unique characteristics of the platform allow you to revisit a lot of core database principles. So I'm being asked to wrap up, so let me actually uh, talk about, summarize the benefits and then play out a, a customer experience notion. Uh, higher per server performance gives you server consolidation benefits, reduces state duplication. Uh, they're being evaluated, our servers are being evaluated at a number of sites, um, and just to kind of hear one specific Wikia customer. It's a place for communities to collaboratively develop content. Wikia has a very typical LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, and then Memcache added in. We operate in a very constrained data center space where power is the main resource and from that follows space. We started looking at SSDs and, and the market when Verdant came along and offered us an evaluation. So given that we have a system that allows us to put servers into production that if they have any problem automatically get removed immediately, we took the Verdant machine and put it into production and tested it out and we're really excited about it. In our evaluations of the Green Cloud machine, we tested putting up to 90% of our database load onto one machine, which it handled without any problem. If we had access to large amounts of really fast persistent memory in more of our machines, uh, I can easily see a situation where by caching, we could also reduce the number of CPUs so we think it's, it's really cool, the kind of performance that we've seen on our queries, on our workloads, on the Green Cloud machine. Th thank you, Arthur. That was Arthur Bergman from Wikia. And that's kind of an example of the type of benefits folks are seeing. So the Green Cloud uh, server for MySQL is one part of the Green Cloud family. Uh, these are our application optimized servers. We also have a memcached server. Come to our booth for more details on these. The roadmap moving forward will see us deliver servers with other incarnations of storage class memory, as well as cluster enabling the offerings here. So to conclude, I just kind of wanted to step back and go back to the question I started off with. What does this mean for the way you think about building scale-out data-centric infrastructures? So in the large, I think storage class memory and the green cloud architecture together completely redefine the compute, memory, and I.O. balance in a, in a, in a server, in a data center. And in some sense, the question to most of you here is what could you do if you had a terabyte of persistent resources available to you that were accessible at the memory level? But in the more immediate term, I think what green cloud servers enable is they enable something that we refer to as smart scaling. They allow you to optimize your performance complexity and cost and energy considerations, and significantly fewer servers simplify the deployment. And this is not just for MySQL and Memcached. We have also announced a development server option and if you have focused applications that can benefit from us, come talk to us. So the capabilities here will change the data center. So it's clear that you will have questions. You know, and some questions could be, is the per unit cost too high for me to even consider? How do we deal with server failure? And the answers are no. Our press release talks about our starting price. And in fact, you might well conclude that the price is too low given the QPS per dollar and QPS per what benefits that we offer. Uh, servers will fail. Server consolidation always is, increases the risk of availability, uh, but there are unique issues here about how we can recover very quickly. In any case, have, we would like to have the conversation with you. Come talk to us. So here's our contact information, and thank you all for your attention.